A guide to growing hot peppers. Spicy and full of flavor, hot peppers are a delicious addition to a variety of dishes. They're also high in vitamins and minerals and can even help with digestion. Their heat comes from capsaicin, a chemical compound found in the veins and ribs of these peppers. Hot pepper varieties. Jalapeno. Thick-walled, juicy, and green, these peppers are between 2,000 to 5,000 SHUs. Habanero. Small, lime green fruits that ripen to red and need lots of heat to mature. They're typically between 100,000 to 350,000 SHUs. Chili Anaheim. This variety matures quickly from green to red, dries fast on the plant, and is mildly hot at 100 to 500 SHUs. Cayenne. A variety producing strong, upright plants. Their dark green bodies turn scarlet when ripe, and they're between 30,000 to 40,000 SHUs. Hot peppers can either be sown directly outside or started inside as transplants. The ideal temperature for hot peppers to germinate is between 75 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 to 32 degrees Celsius. As well, they typically won't germinate when the soil temperatures are below 55 degrees Fahrenheit, 12.7 degrees Celsius. Start seeds inside about 8 to 10 weeks before transplanting, and the seeds can be sown a quarter inch, 0.6 centimeters deep in starter pods, trays, or cell packs. Pepper seedlings will need a warm and sunny spot to start growing, so keep them on a windowsill. Their air temperature shouldn't go below 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 degrees Celsius during the day, or below 65 degrees Fahrenheit, 18 degrees Celsius overnight. It's also best not to rush to transplant the hot peppers outside. They prefer warm climates, so cold temperatures can really weaken them. Once they're ready, set the transplants 12 to 24 inches, 30 to 60 centimeters apart, in rows that are 24 to 36 inches, 60 to 91 centimeters apart. When growing hot peppers in raised beds, Set them about 14 to 16 inches, 35 to 40 centimeters apart. Pepper seeds can also be started by being directly sown outside. To do so successfully, their soil has to be warmed to at least 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 degrees Celsius. Ideally, 65 degrees Fahrenheit, 18 degrees Celsius would be even better. Plant the seeds a half inch, 1.2 centimeters deep, and keep them spaced about 18 inches, 45 centimeters apart. Once the pepper plants have two leaves, thin them to the strongest plant. Hot peppers grow best in slightly acidic soils with a pH of 6.0 to 6.8. They need full sun to thrive and they won't survive in cold temperatures. Nighttime temperatures below 65 degrees Fahrenheit, 18 degrees Celsius, or above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 23 degrees Celsius, can also reduce their fruit production. So keep that in mind. Their ideal air temperature is between 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 to 26 degrees Celsius during the day, and between 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 to 21 degrees Celsius during the night. Plants can drop their blossoms when air temperatures are above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Celsius, and also when they're watered too infrequently. Water early on in the day to allow the leaves time to dry. This helps minimize the risk of disease infection. It's also helpful to pinch back the growing tips, which will encourage leaf growth in pepper plants. Leaves provide shade for the peppers during hot summers and can help prevent them from getting sun scald. Hand pull any weeds around the peppers, since they compete for nutrients and water. Just take care not to damage the plants in the process. Fertilizer. Prepare the soil before planting with four to six cups of an all-purpose fertilizer per 100 square feet, nine meters squared. Well-composted organic matter is another option to use. About two to four inches, five to 10 centimeters per 100 square feet will do the trick. Side dress the peppers with nitrogen, both four and eight weeks after transplanting by applying a quarter tablespoon to each plant, spreading it six inches, 15.2 centimeters next to the plants then water it into the soil. Over-fertilizing pepper plants will encourage excessive leaf growth, but it will delay the growth of the actual peppers. 
mulch. Add straw, newspapers, or wood chips after the plants are well established and once the soil has warmed up. If mulch is added too early, it can actually keep the cold in the soil longer, which is not good for hot peppers. Transplanting Best Practices Pepper plants will need about 8 to 10 weeks before they can be transplanted. Once they have 6 to 9 mature leaves and a well-developed root system, that typically means they're ready. First, pepper seedlings will need to be hardened off. This can be done by exposing them to temperatures between 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 to 18 degrees Celsius, and also by reducing their water intake. Place the plants outdoors in the sun for a few hours per day, increasing their outside hours gradually over the span of one to two weeks. Companion plants do's and don'ts. Cucumbers, tomatoes, oregano, parsley, rosemary, squash, and Swiss chard are all great companion plants for peppers. As well, basil will help deter aphids, and eggplants need similar maintenance as peppers, so they're also another great companion plant. Beans fix nitrogen in the soil, which can stunt the growth of peppers. As well, brassicas have different soil and fertilizer needs, so they don't make good garden companions. Fennel plants attract pests and insects that are harmful to peppers, so they shouldn't be planted with peppers either. Staking for tall varieties. When lightly twined to stakes or wire cages, pepper plants can grow along those supporting stakes. This not only prevents them from snapping in harsh winds later in their growing season, but also saves some garden space. It also promotes air circulation around the plants and decreases the risks for disease infections. Containers. Containers work well, as long as they're large enough to accommodate the whole plant, about 14 inches in diameter per plant. When stakes have to be installed, spacing is even more important, so keep that in mind. As well, make sure the containers have holes in the bottom to promote good soil drainage. Raised beds. These are the ideal option for improving soil's water drainage. Raised beds also have a higher soil temperature than the actual ground, which helps prevent the spread of diseases that favor cool and or moist conditions. In addition, raised beds allow earlier planting in the spring. They also help minimize damage to plants, since the soil around them won't need to be stepped on. Open field. If there's enough space, directly planting into an open field is a great option. With peppers, it's especially important that the soil is well warmed before planting. Support structures like wooden stakes or wire cages can also be installed in the open field area. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations, but if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days, or about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects, like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. 
make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. European Corn Borer When these larvae enter peppers, they leave brown masses on the surface. This damage can also become a gateway for bacterial soft rot, which will typically infect peppers two to three weeks later. Here's what to do. When there's an infestation of these pests, be sure to remove and destroy any affected plants. It's also possible to hand pick single borers if they're found on any plants. Pepper maggots. The adult flies will lay their eggs inside the peppers, which usually means the damage goes unseen until it's too late. The maggots will feed on the inside and leave tunnels behind, which are only really noticed once the pepper either ripens prematurely or dies off. Here's what to do. Use yellow sticky cards to attract and catch the adult flies before they get the chance to lay their eggs. Potential diseases and their solutions. Anthracnose. Small water-soaked spots will appear on a plant's leaves and eventually those spots will get bigger and turn tan or brown in color with a papery texture. This disease thrives in extremely wet weather, and its spores are usually spread by splashing water. It can grow on any part of a plant, except for on the plant's roots. Here's what to do. Plant disease-resistant seeds when possible, and practice good crop rotation. In general, a three-year rotation is a good place to start. As well, avoid using sprinklers or overhead irrigation and water plants from their base to keep leaves as dry as possible. As well, seeds can be treated with hot water prior to planting, 122 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius for 25 minutes. If anthracnose is found on any plants, make sure to destroy and compost the crop residue after harvest. As well, Make sure to follow recommended spacing guidelines, since air circulation and ventilation is important for avoiding a lot of diseases. Finally, when planting in containers, it's important to sterilize those containers before use. Blossom end rot. When plants are affected with this disease, light brown spots will first appear at the bottom of the fruit, and those fruits will often get invaded by another black mold. As the fruit grows, the spots grow bigger, turning into dark, leathery lesions that are sunken into the fruit. Here's what to do. Maintain consistent watering and keep the soil evenly moist. Also, add mulch to help the plants retain water. Straw or black plastic will do the trick. Excess nitrogen also causes blossom end rot on crops because the excess nitrogen blocks the absorption of calcium. As a result, it's best to avoid high nitrogen fertilizers, as well as ammonia fertilizers, like fresh manure. If a plant is already showing signs of end rot in the plant's early fruiting phase, calcium may need to be added into the soil. Keep in mind, though, that calcium isn't taken in well by the leaves, so avoid using a foliar spray. Calcium needs to go directly to the roots, so calcium carbonate tablets, or anti-acid tablets like Tums, can be placed into the soil at the base of the plant. Bacterial leaf spot. It causes dark, sunken, and scab-like lesions to form on plants. Old spots might then turn a light brown color with purple edges. Most common in coastal regions, this disease thrives in temperatures between 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 to 32 degrees Celsius, and it can appear after a heavy rainfall. Bacterial leaf spot is then spread by splashing rain, workers, tools, and machinery. Here's what to do. Practice garden sanitation and keep growing areas free of weeds. Rotating crops is also important in managing this disease. And when possible, 
plant certified disease-resistant seeds. Finally, avoid overhead watering to keep plants safe from bacterial leaf spot. Cucumber mosaic virus. This virus causes ring spots and weird patterns to appear on the leaves of an affected plant. Those leaves will also become small, curled, and malformed. As well, leaves typically become dull gray and leathery. An early infection will affect the fruits in their size, shape, and overall quality. Here's what to do. Remove and destroy infected plants and control any aphid pests since aphids spread the virus. Also, be sure to get rid of perennial weeds like milkweed, marsh cress, and yellow rocket. Just make sure to wash your hands after touching any infected plants. Finally, Pacer, Market More 76, Slice Master, Dasher 2, Space Master, and Sweet Success are all varieties that are resistant to this disease. Phytophthora blight. This disease causes the roots, stems, and fruits of pepper plants to rot. Distinctive black lesions will form on the stem, and the fruit and stems will then wilt. This disease is spread by water, and it typically starts in areas that don't drain well. It can also be spread through infected soil that's stuck to humans or machinery. Here's what to do. Rotate peppers with non-hosts, like corn, small grains, brassicas, and alliums. As well, practice good field sanitation, avoid overwatering, and keep the soil from compacting. It also helps to improve the soil's drainage and to avoid working in the garden when plants are wet. Soft Rot Water-soaked lesions will spread rapidly and cause the fruits of a plant to deteriorate into a slimy, foul-smelling mass. These lesions are soft, sunken, and brown in color. Soft rot typically thrives in warm and moist weather, invading plants through other injuries caused by insect stings, sun scald, or wounding. This disease is usually spread by human activity and the movement of soil, usually becoming a problem when soil has been water-soaked for a long period of time. Here's what to do. Avoid soft rot by planting crops in well-drained soil, allowing the soil to dry in between watering. Make sure crops are planted in the appropriate depth, because when some crops are planted too deep, it increases the severity of the soft rot disease. As well, try not to throw soil onto plants while cultivating, avoid excess irrigation, and take care not to wound any plants. It's also important not to harvest crops during rainy periods, and it's best not to work in the garden when crops are wet. Finally, practice proper tool and hand sanitation, and be sure to remove any decayed plants, because the diseased plants can affect healthy ones as well. Tobacco Mosaic Virus this disease causes the uneven ripening of peppers, as well as light and dark green spots that will appear on the leaves of affected plants. Those leaves will also be smaller and more curled in appearance. When plants become infected at an early stage, the plant's growth gets stunted. It's important to note too that this virus can actually be transmitted by the hands of a smoker, since it lives on tobacco. Here's what to do. Plant disease-resistant varieties when possible. If there is an infection already, make sure to get rid of any affected plants while also practicing proper garden sanitation. Smokers should wash their hands, as well as any clothes that have been covered in smoke to prevent spreading it to the pepper plants. Tomato Spotted Wilt Virus. Affected peppers will have small black lesions while the stems and roots of the plant might have black streaks. Severely infected plants can wilt, and the plant's growth becomes stunted. Here's what to do. Remove and destroy any infected plants. As well, remove weeds that might be hosts for the virus to spread over to pepper plants. Verticulum wilt. A disease causing the yellowing and wilting of lower leaves. 
Also, V-shaped brown lesions will appear, and the plant's roots and stems will also turn brown. Infected leaves wilt, dry out, and eventually die, while the stems of plants might also turn black near the soil line. In general, verticulum wilt can cause the wilting, stunting, or even the death of plants entirely. The disease is typically spread between plants when infected plant material is physically moved from one spot to another. Here's what to do. Plant high quality disease-free seeds and avoid planting in areas that were previously infected with verticulum wilt. It's also important to practice crop rotation with non-vulnerable plants. In general, a three-year crop rotation is a good place to start. As well, make sure plants have enough space in between, since air circulation and ventilation is very important for avoiding disease. Do not over-fertilize or over-water plants, and when watering is done, it's best to do so in the morning to give plants time to dry off during the day. Also, sterilize any containers before use. When there are plants infected with verticulum wilt, be sure to remove and destroy the plants, and also destroy the surrounding soil. It's also important to control weeds around the crops. Water crops regularly, and when possible, provide crops with some afternoon shade. The verticulum wilt fungus can also be rid from the soil by using the solarization process. Simply cover the soil with a tarp, which will heat up the top six inches, 15 centimeters of soil, enough to kill the fungus. Harvesting. Once peppers are firm, they can start to be harvested. Cut the fruits rather than pulling them off to avoid damaging the plant. As well, use rubber gloves to handle the hot peppers. Gloves will protect the skin from burning and other irritations. Note, the same types of chili peppers grown under different conditions can vary greatly in their heat levels. Storing. Pull out the entire bush at the end of the growing season and hang it upside down to ripen the hot varieties. They can also be dried for longer storage in an airy place. As well, single peppers can be hung from a string to dry them 